possible, there are different possibilities where the nerve can be entrapped or injured. So now, um, let's uh, discuss like how a patient with a similar condition, uh, in a suprascapular nerve entrapment or a condition called a suprascapular nerve neuropathy can come to us. So it could be mostly pain, that is a long-standing pain in the shoulder, associated with weakness in the shoulder. Patients usually come with a dull kind of pain behind the shoulder, in the behind part in the scapular area. And they find, it, when we check for the shoulder movements, when we check a comparative movement, that is if I'm checking the right and the left side, if I compare the movements and see, this particular patient will have a definite weakness of the muscle. So if there is a, when there is pain and weakness together, then this is a possibility. So we have to rule out a suprascapular nerve injury or a neuropathy or an entrapment. So how do we do it? So first step is a clinical testing, which I did right now. That is, I check for uh, the muscle power. And once I'm convinced that this particular patient has a weakness, then I send this patient to two particular tests. One is called as electromyography and other is a nerve conduction study. So the nerve conduction study um, is a check for the, uh, for the velocity or the speed at which a particular nerve conducts. For example, if the nerve is traveling or traversing a particular area and there is a compression in any part and that means the speed, so the speed at which the nerve transfers is simple an impulse would be limited or decreased compared to the opposite side. So a patient would have a nerve conduction study positive showing a delayed conduction of the suprascapular nerve. Secondly, you can also have an electromyographic changes. So these two tests will tell us that definitely this particular patient has got a nerve entrapment. So along with that, the next I would do is an MRI scan. MRI would tell me if there is any other swelling, any masses, any compression, any calcification, or any other problem in the shoulder which is actually causing a compression on the suprascapular nerve. So once uh, the report comes back, then we are 100% sure that this particular patient has got a suprascapular nerve entrapment. So now, what are the possible causes of this entrapment or neuropathy? So here, when it enters the notch, normally the notch is kind of U-shaped, quite accommodative, the volume is quite good, but in some patients, the instead of having a, a U-shape, it could be a V-shape or it could be very, very shallow notch. So this is one possibility. Second is, this particular ligament, that is a traversing suprascapular uh, ligament, this ligament could be calcified and thickened, causing a direct compression of the nerve. So here we can see the nerve going, going in, and we can see the, there is an also an accompanying artery which passes on top of the, of the ligament. And if this, there is an uh, entrap in this area, because any of these reasons, whatever I said now, we could have these possibilities. Then other, another possible reason is a patient who have a massive uh, rotator cuff, that is a, a muscle tear in the shoulder, a massive rotator cuff tear with a retracted cuff. It is another cause. And another would be like, the, the anatomy could be absolutely normal and we could be having a postural problem. A patient has a protracted scapula. That means the scapula would be tilted like a patient has a typical uh, you know, slouch position and the scapula is kind of tilted forward and this again can cause a traction. So when the, scap the nerve coming like this and there is a tilt like this on the scapula, this can again cause an entrapment. So then um, once the nerve goes in, we come to this particular area and we discuss what are the possible causes of entrapment or compression in this area. I was telling you that you know this particular area beyond the suprascapular notch is called as a spinoglenoid notch. The name comes from the glenoid, which is the socket, and the spine of the scapula. So this is spine of the scapula, and the socket is in this position. So this is this particular interval, or this area is called as a spinoglenoid notch. So now what happens is, certain patients could be having cysts in that area, called as spinoglenoid cysts. So what happens is, um, there could be small tears in the shoulder, in the socket area, through, and through these tears, the joint fluid or the synovial fluid escapes out and balloons. And this is called as a cyst. So you can see that if there's a tear in this area or the, or the part of the socket, and there's a fluid which
which kind of extravasates out and forms a cyst. This cyst could appear in different areas. When the cyst appears in the spinoclinoid area, that is in the upper part of the socket, this area, there could be a direct compression of the nerve resulting in uh, entrapment. So, how do we differentiate? The last, this would be the last important question in a surgeon's mind to find out where exactly is the problem. So, how can we differentiate between a suprascapular nerve entrapment, that is in the suprascapular notch, and in the spinal glenoid notch? So, if it's, when it entraps or there's a compression in the suprascapular notch in this area, the patient will have weakness both in the supraspinatus, that is the lifting muscles, as well as the infraspinatus, which is an external data. So, now if the patient has weakness in both the muscle supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, and when there is a muscle wasting, means when you when we ask the patient to take off his shirt and when we look from the back, we can find that if there is an entrapment or weakness of muscle, that particular muscle shrinks in size. And this condition called as wasting, muscle wasting. So muscle wasting, if it is present in the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus with weakness of both, then it is a problem at the notch, suprascapular notch. At the same time, if the, if the compression is at the spinal glenoid notch, that is a little more down, the supraspinatus muscle escapes because already the supply to the suprascapular uh, supraspinatus is already there. It is intact, there is no compression there and the affection is only on the infraspinatus. That means the weakness will be only of the infraspinatus, muscle wasting will be only of the infraspinatus, then the problem is in the spinal glenoid notch and most commonly it is because of a cyst in that area or the spinal glenoid cyst. So that sums up the possible causes and how a surgeon finds out um, about the possible causes of um, suprascapular nerve entrapment. So now how do we manage? So if, so whenever a patient has a significant weakness and it is very well documented that there is a cyst we have to decompress the cyst. Or if there is a calcification or, a, or, a, or an entrapment at the suprascapular notch, we have to release the entrapment and let the nerve free. And only then it will come back to its normalcy. At the same time, if it is more of a postural problem, there is no other mechanical problems, that is, there's, uh, there's no you know, anatomical problem, there's no calcification, there's no cyst, there's no pathology, pathological problem, then we can always, and if it is only a postural thing, we can cut it through proper physiotherapy, correcting the biomechanics and trying to see if the patient is improving. And so now uh, coming to the surgical part, that is if there is a possible compression somewhere. If there is a compression at the suprascapular notch, we can uh, release it by a simple arthroscopic surgery called as arthroscopic suprascapular nerve release. So where we put a camera in the shoulder, we find out exactly the ligament and we can just release and cut the ligament open and just leave it free. The nerve escapes and the compression relieves. If the compression is finally not cyst, this again can be treated by an arthroscopic cyst decompression and a nerve release. So what we do is we put a camera in, we find out where the cyst is, the cyst is released from inside or outside, different techniques of doing it, again arthroscopic and now, when the cyst is released, we also release and visualize the nerve, find out the nerve is okay and it is completely released off. So, and patient usually recover after the particular surgery by three to six months because we should understand it is a nerve entrapment and the nerve has been compressed for quite a long time and even if you release it, it takes a pretty long time, three to six months before the patient actually recovers with proper physiotherapy and gets its normal movements back, normal bowel back and the pain completely disappears in time.